the other day. It's been a while back. I read an account of the appearances of the resurrected Lord. So I came across an unusual pair of statements in John chapter 20. The first statement is made to Mary. She was the one that first saw the Lord after he arose from the grave. In verse 17 of John 20, it says this, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. <clears throat> so I read this unusual statement by the Lord. Touch me not. <clears throat> then as I was reading uh, further on, eight days later, the disciples were together on a Monday evening, and he told Thomas, by the way, we errantly call him Doubting Thomas. There's not a one of us in here that does not have the same nature that Thomas had. I don't think we give Thomas the credit that he deserves. <clears throat> he was a realist. He just saw things in a real fashion and he said, I'm not going to believe until I really see the nail prints in his hand. That's not doubt. <clears throat> He's just realistic. He's not going to take anything just from hearsay. By the way, that's a good thought. That's a good uh, trait to have. What you hear, half the time what you hear is not true anyway. How many of you know that? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't care whether you like it or don't like it. A lot of stuff you don't hear, you hear on TV is not true. I would suppose that probably 90% of it's not true. Uh, but I don't know. But let me tell you this. <clears throat> Thomas said this. Jesus said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. This is eight days later. And behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. <clears throat> the title of the message is, Touch Me Not, or Touch Me. On Sunday, the day of the resurrection, he tells Mary, not to touch him. And on Monday, eight days later, he tells Thomas, touch me, basically. This presents a problem to my mind. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I'm like Thomas. I'm realistic. Now, how? what's going on here? He says, in one case, touch me. In another case, he said, don't touch me. And something's wrong. You say, well, it could have been. Did the Lord ascend between... The time he talked to Mary on the first day of the resurrection, did he ascend into heaven and come back? Is that what happened? I don't think so, but it could have been something like that. Or was his glorified body changed in the eight days between the resurrection Sunday and the next Monday? Did, did that ch something change about his body? Was there something about his wounds, uh, his hands and his feet and his side. Was well, there something about his wounds that were touchable and the rest of him was not touchable? What is the answer to all these questions? <clears throat> well, there are a lot of questions in my mind about these two statements. Touch me not and then reach hither thy finger. Reach hither thy hand. So here's what I want to do. I don't want to answer all those questions. I don't have time to even delve into the questions that my mind present to myself. But I want to shed some light on this scripture and see what you think about it. How many of you are ready for a little bit of light from heaven? I just like it when God gives me a little bit of light. So I want to shed some divine light on this dilemma in my mind. First, let's look at the scene of the first appearance of our Lord after his resurrection. This would be a good Easter sermon, but I, I declare it's good to preach resurrection any time. Here's the scene. It's a garden. You say, well, preacher, we understand that. I understand it too. But Mary supposed that Jesus was the gardener, so we know that it was a garden. 
And a gardener attended to the plants of that particular place. That's supposedly what he did, took care of them. And John tells us specifically that the place of the Lord's burial was in a garden. John 19, the chapter before, verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. Now, as we think about this garden, I don't know about you, but I immediately go back to the original garden. I don't know about you, but that's what I think. And I also go back to the original law. Here's a garden, and in this garden is a sepulcher. It's a place of the dead. And the law of the Old Testament says, Jews, you don't go near a dead body. Because if you go near a dead body, you'll get polluted. And we didn't understand that, but they tell me in uh, scientific terminology that it's a good thing for us not to be around a dead body because we might get whatever they had that caused their death. I wouldn't want to be an undertaker, would you, or an embalmer or anything like that. But can I tell you something? <clears throat> this was a place of the dead, and the Jews were not supposed to be there. And here's Mary going into that garden. It was a garden of the dead. It was a garden that is reminiscent of the Garden of Eden because it was there in the Garden of Eden where <clears throat> death and the grave got its beginning. There was no death until the Garden of Eden and the sin of Adam and Eve. And now death gets a start and grave gets a start. And so here's the original garden where the Lord put man, where there was no death and there was no grave, and all of a sudden now there's a death in the garden and a grave in the garden. And here we have another garden where the Lord was resurrected. Praise God for that. Amen. You could preach on the garden a long time. But I'm, I'm so glad that now in this garden, there's no more death because Jesus arose from the grave. So in the garden of death where he was, he came forth. So death is conquered, the grave is conquered, and the prohibition of the law, thou shalt not go near this dead body, that law is completely gone. The Jew had the liberty at this point, even to, I don't think Mary knew it, but the Jew had the liberty at this point because Jesus had risen from the grave. They could go into this garden. Aren't you glad now that we can go to the garden where Jesus defeated death and defeated the grave? Amen? Right now this morning, I can say, I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear the grave. I know I'm looking forward, one of the, not really looking forward to it, but I know that I must in the future accept the fact that I'm going to leave this place. But I don't have to look at it with fear and dread. I can come to the garden, so to speak, and I can say, I don't fear death because Jesus arose from the grave in the garden. So I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> so the curse of death and the grave has been laid to rest. I like that. The curse of death and the grave has been laid to rest in the garden because of Jesus' resurrection. So here is what Song of Solomon said. Song of Solomon said that Jesus is our fountain of life. I'm not going to read the scripture in the Song of Solomon. But every garden has a fountain. And Jesus is the fountain in the garden. He's the fountain of life. There is no fountain of death in the garden. Can you imagine a fountain in a garden that had polluted, poisonous waters that killed everything around it? That wouldn't be a garden long, would it? Thank God for a garden that has life. Amen. Fountain of life. So simply put, I can say, as I'm trying to get my questions answered about this dilemma that I have, I know it's a garden, and I know it's a garden where Jesus rose from the grave, and I know it's a garden where death and the grave are defeated. I know that. And he's the life. So I know it's a different garden. Now, Mary, she could go into that garden freely. She didn't know about it, but she could. Now, there's something else about this garden. Mary is the only human in the garden. You say, well, what about the soldiers? I don't know. I guess they were laying down half dead or dead. I'm, I'm not sure what happened to them. But she's the only human in the garden. Who is this Mary? Who is this human in the garden? <clears throat> it's Mary Magdalene. It's the one that the Lord had cast out seven devils. 
Now, I would have thought that Mary, the mother of the Lord, would have been the first one to witness the resurrected Lord. But this is the one that the Lord had cast out seven devils, and she's the one that the Lord chose to see him first. Now, you think about that. Is that a picture of grace or what? I mean, amazing grace. Here's God says, this woman that was so sinful, I'm going to let her be the first one to see me rise from the grave. But she didn't know that it was the Lord at that point in time. She was plagued or had been plagued with seven devils. I don't know about you, but one devil's enough. I don't need seven. Any of you need seven devils? They say the seven cardinal sins are this. Pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. It could have been <clears throat> that Mary was plagued with all of those or even some more. And it's something that amazed me as I read that list of the seven cardinal sins or uh, worst sins, I guess. Pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. I figured something out. They all kind of run in tandem. Have you ever seen a tandem Situate like car and trains in a in a, on a track, but it running in tandem. Can I tell you something? These seven godly sins just kind of run together: pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. What is notable here is that this woman was a follower of Christ, and she no longer was plagued by these seven devils. She didn't have them anymore. Isn't that wonderful? How many of you glad you're saved? And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus has power over the devils that plague us. Amen. And there are plenty of devils around, or demons if you want to call them that. And they plague the believer. Right. But Jesus is more powerful than those devils. Amen. You can remember that. So here she is. She no longer has the devils plaguing her. She has been forgiven much. And she has great affection you say well nothing could have replaced the affection that Mary the mother of the Lord had but that could have been a motherly affection this sinner past sinner had an affection for the Lord that was godly and divine he has saved me from all these terrible devils and she loved her Lord and it was because of her love and affection for the Lord that she was the first one at the garden. <clears throat> Can I tell you something? I got another question that's plaguing my mind. How much do I love the Lord? How much do you love the Lord? Would you have been the first one there? Do you love him that much? I can't do without him. I know he's dead, and I know they crucified him, and I know he's in the ground because I helped put him there and I'll embalm him and something, put the spices and wrap the things. I helped do that, and I know he's in that grave, but I can't get over him. I can't get away from him. I've got to go see him. How many of you have that kind? Can I tell you something? Here's your Bible. And I wonder if you are over here saying, I must read my Bible sometime today. Yeah. Or if you say, I got to have it. I got to have I got to I got to read it. How much do you love your Bible? How much do you really long for it? This is the Jesus that we have. It's the written Jesus. We, we have a living Lord inside our hearts, but this is a written Jesus. How much do you love him? Can I tell you something real quick? The amount of affection that you have for the Lord is determined by how sinful you see yourself. She knew that she was a wicked person. She knew that her past was awful. She saw herself as sinful. And because the Lord had saved her from her terrible sins, she loved him much. And I tell you something, I don't care how goody-goody two-shoes you've been in your life. 
or how sinful you've been in your life, can I tell you one thing? No person will love the Lord until they see their own sinfulness. As we see our sinfulness, we see our affection for the Lord rise. If you think you're pretty good, you probably don't love him much. You know why? It's hard to love self and to love him. You can figure that one out for yourself. Mary Magdalene was the only human in the garden. Her affection was great. I wonder if she remembered something that he said about rising from the grave. I wonder. Maybe she did. Was she so connected with the Lord that she could not stay away from him? The fact is, is that this former great sinner is the only human that went to the grave that Sunday morning. Oh, there were others. We know the stories, but you look it up. Now, I want to say something else about Mary. When she gets there to the grave, she kneels down and she's weeping as she looks into the sepulcher. So she had a great affection, but she got a great humility. Great humility. She didn't walk into the garden saying, Woohoo! Look how great I am now. I've got all the devils gone. Now, folks, ain't nothing wrong with shouting about the deliverance and victory. I'm glad we have victory in Jesus, and the Bible tells me to praise the Lord. And we ought to do that in the right way. But this lady is coming to see the Lord, and she's humble. She's on her knees, bowing, and she's weeping. <clears throat> The very Lord that she was looking for had changed her pride to humility. Only a proud woman could have lived the way she lived in adultery and sin and fornication. But the Lord had changed her pride to humility. The Lord will change greed to giving. The Lord will change wrath to love. The Lord will change envy to kindness. The Lord will change lust to charity. The Lord will change gluttony to moderation. And the Lord will change slothfulness to faithful working. That's what our resurrected Lord will do. You see, the resurrection had changed her life. She didn't know about it yet. But the resurrection and the Lord that was the one who rose from the grave had changed her life. From a life of sin to something completely different. By the way, since Jesus came into my heart, what a wonderful change had been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Now, while she's weeping, she's looking into that sepulcher and she's looking around through watered eyes. How many of you know what it's like to look through eyes that are full of tears? Can you see clearly? No, it's dim. And she's looking through these dim, the dim vision that she's got, and she's trying to see the sepulcher. And she sees two angels. Oh, I like this. She didn't see the Lord. Praise God for that. She will later, but not right now. The Lord's not in there. Amen. Praise God, the tomb is empty. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad the tomb's empty? But she sees two angels. Through her tear-stained eyes, she sees two angels. <coughs> one's at the head of the sepulcher where the Lord laid, and one's at the foot. You say, what do you get out of that? The Lord took care of his, God took care of his son from head to foot. Yeah. Amen. The angels of Attended the Lord. They had a ministry. I don't know what else their ministry was, but their ministry was simply to go to the grave and attend the body of the Lord for three days. Amen. You sit at the head and you sit at the foot, God might have said, and you take care of every single thing he needs. Oh, yes, it was God's pleasure that he put him to death on the cross. God did that at Isaiah 53, but he said, angels, you take care of him. I like that, don't you? How many of you know 
that angels are taking care of you from head to foot. From your head to your foot, there's an angel or two taking care of you. That rhymed and I didn't even know it. Thank God for a good rhyme. Can you tell you something? Angels are real. They're not something, a figment of your imagination. They're real. You say, well, I can't see them. You might not can see them, but praise God, they're still there. And I'm going to tell you something. Before you get out of here, you're going to realize there's an unseen world. There's an unseen hand. There's unseen things going on. And we can't see it, but it's going on right now. And I'll tell you what's going on. Angels are at your head and at your feet taking care of you. Amen. I want you to know something. God hadn't forsaken you. God is taking care of you lock, stock, and barrel from top to bottom. Amen? You got angels. And not only did she see the angels, but she talked to them. Right, well, Lord, I don't talk to angels. I mean, people think I'm crazy if I'm talking to angels. Well, I'll be honest with you. If an angel talked to you, you ought to talk back. But I'd wait for one to talk to me. But she didn't wait for one to talk to me. She, she looked at talks to her. She looked at those angels. She said, what in the world have they done with my Lord? I, I'm putting it in my language. Now, basically those angels said to her, why, why are you weeping? They knew, they knew something. How many of you know the angels knew something? They had said before, he is not here, he is risen. They had already said that. And so now this, uh, I'm not sure all the time frame there, but can I tell you something? Uh, the angels had a message. He's not here. He's gone. He's not here. He's not in this grave. What did the angels want Mary to know? Just weeping, why weepest thou? What are you doing? Why are you weeping? He's not here. He He, he arose. What are you weeping for? But can she help it? She's still weeping. Now about that time, as after she had seen those angels, she gets a feeling that something is close by. Oh my goodness. I got to get on here with this lesson. So she's kneeling and she's weeping and she's looking into the sepulcher and she's aware of a presence. She doesn't know it's the Lord, but she, she senses. Have you ever sent somebody behind you? Anybody? They didn't make a sound, but they came sneaking up behind you. Not one sound, but you knew somebody was there. Ever happened to you? Uh -huh. she sent and so she kind of half turned not, not all the way turned you can look at the scriptures it says and when she had thus said she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus she's kneeling and weeping and Jesus is standing now, folks, I got I got news for you. I don't think this kneeling, weeping woman went, "Hello, Lord." I believe she's looking at the lower extremities. She just supposed that he was the gardener. She knew not that it was the Lord. She just sensed his presence. I'm going to tell you something real quick. You don't have to see the Lord to know He's present. You say, preacher, if I could just see him, you don't have to see him. The Lord is present whether you see him or not. Amen. And I'm going I'm to promise you this one thing. If you walk in with the Lord, there are going to be times when you know he's there. You can't, no doubt about it. <clears throat> it is re reminiscent of other things in the Bible, but uh, I'll not take time to talk about that so Mary's not recognizing the Lord but she also knows that something's there somebody's standing there how many of you have ever heard the old song stand by me when the storms of life are raging stand by me how many of you know it it's in the book can I tell you something 
the Lord is standing by us. Can you remember that? How many of you can remember? The Lord is standing by us. But I got some more news for you. <clears throat> I'm getting plenty of light out of my scripture. When I'm kneeling in prayer, he especially likes to stand by me. When you pray and when your heart is torn up, her heart's tearing up. I mean, it's, it's a mess. And she's kneeling and weeping and the Lord's standing by her. Can I tell you something? The Lord is standing by you right now. And especially when you pray. Amen? How many of you are glad he's still standing there? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But something else happened. While she's standing and kneeling and weeping and looking around and supposing Jesus to be the gardener, all of a sudden Jesus says, Mary? Man, that changed things real quick. How many of you know that immediately she knew that voice? Immediately! She knew the voice of Jesus. Can I tell you something? If you know him, my sheep hear my voice, John said. Amen? And can I tell you something? If you are a sheep of Jesus, you can hear his voice. And I'll tell you where you hear it the most. When you read the scriptures, you'll hear his voice. I like that, don't you? Immediately she says, Rabona. And that means Master. Now, I got another problem. Here's another problem. I, I, I do, I'm a Thomas. Here, I'm Thomas. The Lord told the disciples, call no man master or call no man Rabboni. And that's what the disciples knew. No man was to be called master or Lord because we are to be servants. Amen. Mary Magdalene knew that the Lord had told the disciples, call no man Lord or Rabboni. And the first thing out of her mouth is Rabboni. Yeah, amen. Why? She knew who the master was. Amen. I like. Can I tell you something? The Lord's either the master of your life or he's not master at all. You say, well, I know that quote goes this way. The Lord is either the Lord of your life or not Lord at all. Can I tell you something? Either he's running your life or you are, and if you are, you're in a heap of trouble. Can I tell you that? You say, well, I can run my own life. you in a lot of trouble. I promise you that won't work. <clears throat> she knew who the master was. Was Mag How many of you know that Mary Magdalene had already been saved? She had already gotten seven devils cast out of her. She was saved, right? And now at this point in time, at the resurrection scene, she's saying, Rabboni. You say, preacher, what are you saying? Some people say that you have to make him Lord when you get saved. That's false doctrine. I didn't know anything about lordship salvation when I accepted Christ as my personal savior. But I'll promise you this. As I grew in the Lord, I finally found out you got to call him master. I believe in lordship salvation that goes on and on and on. In other words, not when I first believed, I didn't know anything about calling him master. But after I believed, then I said, he's my master. Amen. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of people in here and in other churches and everywhere around the world, saved people, never made him master. They need to make him master today. Make him the ruler of your life. Well, anyway. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Jesus, I've got to finish this up. How many of you are ready for this to be done? I, I'm getting some light on the subject, okay? Now, here's what, here's the saying. She's dealing and she's weeping and now, now she recognizes the Lord. And she's turned herself completely around from the tomb. She turns her back to the empty tomb. Ooh, I like that. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? The empty tomb's not important. It's the one that's come out of the tomb that's important. You don't need to go. Well, I, do go, I did go the whole land in 1980. But we don't need to worship the tombs and we don't need to worship the dead. Right? We worship the living Christ. So she turns her back. You know, there's so many applications here, I can't hardly stand it. But anyway, she turns her back to the tomb and she's 
kneeling, weeping, and there's the Lord. This had happened before. And when it happened before, she fell at his feet and embraced him. And this is what she probably was going to do, grab his feet. And he said, touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my father, to your father, to my God, and to your God. Touch me not. Now, what was the next thing the Lord said? He said in verse 17 of John 20 to Mary, Go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. He said, I've got a message for you. And I want you to get this. How many of you ready for some light? You ready for some light? He said, I want you to get this. Go tell my brethren. Now here's the truth I want you to get. She wanted to show her affection to the Lord and grab his feet. She wanted to worship. And the Lord said, nope, it's not time for that. I got a message that you and only you can tell. The message is, go to my brethren and tell them. Now, here's the truth, and I want you to get this truth. The message that we have is more important than the worship we desire. Have you got that? I want you to get this real clear. The message that we have, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is more important than the worship that we desire. She wanted to worship. He wanted her to go tell. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of people got worship ahead of telling and Jesus wants us to get the priority straight. Telling is more important than the worship. Everybody got that? You say, preacher, is that the light? That's exactly what's going on here. Jesus is saying to Mary, it's not time to worship. It's time to tell. Amen. Don't touch me. Get with it. We can do plenty of touching later. In fact, eight days later, he tells Thomas to touch him. And that was later on. So we've got 40 days. He'll be with, I'll be with you 40 days. And we can do plenty of touching and plenty of worship. But right now, you got to tell. And I tell you something, we're going to be with Jesus one of these days forever. And there's plenty of time to worship. We're going to worship him for eternity. We're going to fall at his feet for eternity. We're going to show our affection for him for eternity. Now's not the time. Now's the time to tell. Tell. Well, what about Thomas Preacher? Thomas had a little faith. He did have a problem with faith. He was a realistic person, but his faith was not as strong as Mary's. You see, faith and affection have a close kin. But anyway, his uh, faith was not quite as strong. Now, what does that mean for me right now? When Thomas would be commissioned to go and tell the world he had to have stronger faith. And the Lord wants to strengthen the faith of those who don't have quite the faith that they should have so they can go tell. Mary had the faith. And he says, you go tell. Thomas, not quite there in faith. And he says, you can touch me if you want to. I just want to help your faith so that you can go tell. Can I tell you something, folks? There's a whole bunch of us don't have faith. We like Thomas. We don't have a lot of faith. But he says, today, I want you to touch me. Touch me. And you can have faith. And you can go tell. Mary's going to tell. Thomas, you go tell. Folks, don't ever forget this. I got a dilemma in my mind completely solved. It wasn't the ascension that was so important. It was the message that was important. Go tell. Don't touch me now. Go tell. Or touch me and increase your faith. And then go tell. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, 
I pray that you would take the message and you would use it. I pray this every time I preach. But Lord, I believe you gave me this message and I believe it's something for every one of us to realize something. We've got eternity to worship, but we only have a short, short, brief lifespan to tell. Now is the time for God's people to tell the message of salvation. Help us to be busy doing that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grab you a hymnal, turn over to page 485 with me. Let's sing a little bit of Have Thy Own Way, page 485, and stand if you can. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for the church and the sweet spirit. Thank you for the message, Lord. Lord, I ask you to let us deepen our hearts to grow into something, Lord, to help us grow spiritually and draw closer to you. These things we ask, Lord, in your son Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen.